According to the World Stroke Organization, stroke is the second leading cause of death and the third leading cause of death in, and disability combined. The Heart and Stroke Foundation of South Africa say 10 people in the country suffer from a stroke every hour. For more on this, let's speak to Tamsin Banath, chair of the Southern African Neurological Rehabilitation Association and speech language therapist, uh, Sean Forster, who is a stroke survivor himself and volunteer at the Stroke Survivor Foundation. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Tamsin, let's start you. with you. Uh, Tamsin, what is a stroke mm. and what are its effects? A stroke is damage to the brain caused by any interruption to the blood supply. So it can take on many forms. It can be a blockage in a blood vessel or it can be a burst blood vessel. It ranges in terms of size, position and severity. Um, and th therefore that affects how it presents. So one can have affected speech, a weak or paralyzed arm and or leg, uh, difficulty with mobility, difficulty with memory. It really depends on the position of the stroke and the severity of the stroke. Yeah. So Sean, stress is not the only uh, risk factor of strokes. You were a managing director for a multinational uh, company. Tell us your story. Why and when uh, did you suffer from a stroke? Well, Desiree, Fortunately for me, stress was not the cause of my stroke. However, it is one of the contributing factors to stroke, as I'm aware. From my personal experience, I suffer from a hereditary disorder called factor V laden, which is blood clotting. So as Taz Tamsin mentioned earlier, my, my stroke resulted as a lack of supply to my brain directly from a blood clot. And I wasn't aware that I suffered from this uh, hereditary disease because my parents passed away when I was young. So there was no one to tell me. At least now I can make others aware to get yourself checked for all this type of stuff because it's very real. Yeah. Tamsin, I'm living testament. Yeah. Tamsin, the, the type of stuff that Sean is talking about, what are these things that people should be looking out for? Uh, sorry, uh, I missed that question. The, the audio stopped for a minute. Can you please? I was just picking up on what Sean says about the type of stuff people should be looking out for. What are these things that people should be looking out for? We seem to have lost Thames in there and we'll continue our conversation with Sean until uh, we get her back. Uh, but just Sean, how did you know you were attacked by a stroke and how did it affect you? Well, I actually didn't know personally that I had a stroke. I was doing woodwork in my garage at home with my wife and she just looked at me and said, why am I speaking so funny and why am I drooling? And thankfully, she reacted so quickly and got medical help and got me into hospital because she was aware of the fact that I could have been having a stroke. Yeah, and you. Whilst I wasn't. And you highlight, Sean, one of the important things uh, that they talk about all the time that it's important to react swiftly as soon as you see. Uh, uh, those symptoms. But Tamsin, uh, I was asking you, thanks and, and welcome back. What are the things that people should be looking out for that they need to react to immediately? Because, um, you know, it could be anything. It might not necessarily be a stroke, but what are the surefire ones that are uh, stroke related? All right, our connection with Tamsin once again just failing us. So it's okay, uh, Sean, uh, we can continue with our conversation and thanks uh, for your patience. But um, those first few hours are crucial in treating stroke. What happens to you uh, afterwards? You, you went in for a medical attention and what happened? What followed? Well, the only thing that I can remember, to be fair, is an ambulance picking me up and taking me straight to hospital. 
where they administered the TPA injection, which dissolves the blood clot so that your body is able to resume its normal blood flow to the brain. And once they had stabilized me, I was then moved out of heart care and pretty much told I had recovered, but I had nowhere near recovered. Yeah. That's why it's been invaluable me joining the Stroke Survivor Foundation because we've just recently launched a program called PDSS, which is post-discharge support system. Because when I had my stroke, everyone thought that because I survived my stroke, I was fine, but I was far, far from fine. Yeah. Yeah. Only when you go home, eventually, do you start learning to live with your new life. And as I'm sure Tamsin can attribute to you, neurologically, there's a term that's called neuroplasticity, which means basically that your neuro pathways can regrow given the right stimulation. And I have been religiously attending my physiotherapy or all of my outpatient therapy and my occupational therapy, because stroke, as you know, affects your cognitive ability, memory, and your physical ability. Mm -hmm. I'm just quite fortunate that my stroke left me able to still communicate with you, Desiree. Which is fantastic, uh, Thames, and it's important what Sean is saying that uh, you can redevelop your neural pathways. They can be they can be regrowth there. This is an important development, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. This is a very important point, and I apologise for my disappearing act earlier with the internet. Um, but um, it's, it's a very important point. I think it's important for all stroke survivors and everyone to really know that the potential for neurological recovery is something that we are all still discovering as therapists, the doctors. We don't know the potential of each person to recover. And that's why it's so important for people to receive therapy early on, to receive ongoing intervention and to not give up on the fact that they are able to recover because the brain's potential is, is infinite. It's something that we don't fully understand yet. And the brain is able to reroute, it's able to recover, it's able to take shortcuts. Um, it's, it's unlimited in, in what it's able to do, especially given the correct therapy and intervention. Okay, time constraints, but Sean, just a quick one. Your road to recovery, how has that journey been like for you? And uh, as you said, you're using it uh, to enlighten others. I try to. It has been a blessed journey to date. And I'm fortunate to be surround, surrounded with fellow survivors, like my CEO at the Stroke Survivor Foundation, because they understand and can empathize with what you're going through. Because it's like somebody just push reset in your brain. I can't describe it. It's, you like forget to be able how to walk, how to speak, and what to do. Mm. Essentially, you're a, a three-year-old baby in an adult body. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned before, I was a senior executive before my stroke. So you can imagine my level of independence then and now. Although I'm grateful that I'm able to now look back on my journey and pass on my experiences to other fellow survivors. I'm going to thank... Uh, and there's a lot of myths that are around stroke, that it only happens to old people, which is nonsense, because yeah. I was 45. Wow. And I think in fairly good health when I had my stroke. 
Yeah, I think we've lost Tamsin again, but just in time. Uh, Tamsin Bernard, okay, Chair apologies. of the Southern African Neurological Rehabilitation Association and Speech and Language Therapist. Uh, Sean Forster uh, was, is also a stroke survivor and volunteer at the Stroke Survivor Foundation. As uh, We make these efforts here at the agenda just to try and prepare our matriculants as they look forward to the release of their results. Uh, uh, another batch tomorrow, another one Thursday. Earlier on, we were speaking to Naven Subamani, a psychologist, just to uh, create these conversations about dealing with stress, especially, particularly for those ones who didn't make it.